Hi, and welcome to Get Wet with Stray Johnson. This will be part of my Division 3 on lesbian sexual health. Uh, today, our topic is hookups and protection. Yay! Yay! Yay. In light of Washington, D.C. becoming the first U.S. city to give out free female condoms, the tide of women's sexual health in a governmental level seems to be changing. Yet, if one is not in a major metropolitan area, it can be very difficult to get a hold of supplies, such as dental dams, in places that aren't specialty stores. And even then, there's no real assurance of quality. Uh, quality, in fact, uh, the thickness of a dental dam, uh, the quality of a glove, and like how much people think they can feel, seems to be a large factor in whether or not uh, people feel as though they will be having safe sex or not. Um, that was not, that was very clumsily said, but ambiguous. Um, lesbians in particular, we number about 2.3 million in America, hi guys, uh, and queer women are rarely seen as a risk group for STDs, which leads to the erroneous concept that lesbians do not need to engage in protected sex. Uh, but the main goals of today's workshop and today's TV show, yay, um, are that lesbians do in fact need to have protected sex, as do queer women uh, and queer female assigned people. Um, as low risk behaviors um, do not mean that there is no risk of, contact, of, of contracting STDs and STIs. Uh, this is complicated by the fact that major health, health organizations insistence that lesbians do not constitute a cohesive risk group uh, is incorrect for propagating a safer sex agenda. So we're gonna talk a little bit about why women who have sex with women don't have protected sex, why they do, and what would help them do it more. So. We're gonna start with the CDC, the, Cent uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Lesbian Sex. First and foremost, there is a gross lack of research on women who have sex with women and their sexual patterns. That makes many conversations like this difficult because the CDC has no confirmed cases of HIV in, uh, that could conclusively be linked to having sex with women in the United States. Uh, the following information comes from the CDC's HIV AIDS Among Women Who Have Sex With Women, which was published in June of 2006. The constant insistence that lesbian safe, uh, sex is safe sex leads to the idea that there is no reason to put money into safer sex supplies for women who have sex with women, as there has been in major cities such as New York for men who have sex with men. Uh, though, the, though later in their study they indicate that both vaginal secretions and menstrual blood pose risks for infection. About two uh, 246,461 women uh, are reported as having HIV in the United States. Of these women, 7,381 are reported to have sex with women. Uh, these findings are highly convoluted because uh, they were not determined to be linked to actually having sex with women because many of the women were found to have more risky factors, uh, which is defined by the CDC as intravenous drug use or having sex with men. Um, and often physicians do not ask women why, uh, if they have had sex with women, uh, which points largely to a medical bi bias and misinformation about women who have sex with women. Uh, in 60% of all cases of HIV, women aren't asked for a full uh, sexual history, uh, which la uh, largely excludes conversations with doctors about whether or not women are having sex with other women. Uh, yes, so now we're gonna open it up to our first question, uh, which we were here at four got. Um, do you ask your doctors about how to have protected sex based on risk categories? and? What do you think are some of the barriers that keep women who have sex with women from talking to their doctors about sexual risks? Can you define risk categories? Yeah, um, and I should have done it, so thanks. <laughs> um, risk categories are, uh, have primarily to do with the sort of sex that you engage in. Uh, so if you are someone who uh, engages in a lot of mouth to anus uh, kind of interaction, or if you're someone who primarily has sex with women, if you're an intravenous drug user, uh, all of those, or if you're someone who has sex with both men and women, if you have sex with men who have sex with other women, um, other women, if you are someone who has uh, sex with men who have sex with other men, those all determine whether you're in a high risk category, a low risk category, or a moderate risk category. Um, so what do we think are some factors that keep, other than the fact that that's such a convoluted uh, definition in the <laughs> first place, uh, that keep women who have sex with women from talking to their doctors about this, other than the assumptions that doctors have. 
I don't think it's something that physicians really bring up. Uh, <coughs> your first injury, like um, you know, a clinic, or you're you're going for your yearly like Pat's Pat's um, appointment or something like that. It's really ironic, funny that you're bringing this up because this was a conversation that I was having last night, like just how awkward it is, and then settling to go in and talk to your doctor and like when they ask you if you're like sexually active, they don't really define that, and then when you do bring it up, like hey, I'm in a relationship with a woman right now, I'm like. Potentially, they don't go further with that. And it's just weird. Well, it's almost as if, like, the answer, yes, but I have sex with other female bodied folks, yeah. is the same as saying no. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, the, the response you'd get for no and yes, but are the exact same. I've definitely asked um, <laughs> my gynecologist and my healthcare physician on a number of occasions, like, specific <laughs> questions about, like, scenarios and different kinds of safer sex, pra se safer sex practice. And I remember asking my gynecologist one day um, a really specific question about what sorts of STIs can be like contracted in what kinds of ways. And I gave her some examples of things I was really curious about. And she says, you know, you're really sweet. Do you think you could give my son a tour of Hampshire College when he's looking at schools next year? Um, and I think that that was the closest that she ever came to answering any of my questions about <laughs> sexual health. And this person is my gynecologist. Um, and I think that a lot of times um, when, when I'm talking to, to healthcare professionals, their primary concern when it comes to my body is whether or not I'm going to get pregnant or whether or not I'm going to contract HIV. And because I'm not considered high risk, they don't really care about my other questions. Nonetheless, yeah. it seems like they don't have the answers. <laughs> the content of this <laughs> most recent dialogue, uh, coupled with the fact that there is a cultural taboo about talking about any protected sex, particularly among lesbians uh, and in like lesbian circles of friends. Uh, thus, uh, so, jeez, uh, I'm going to try that again. Uh, this coupled with the fact that there's cultural uh, taboo around talking about protected sex among lesbians means that many people do not, lesbians do not report using any sort of protection with female partners at all. Uh, this in and of itself is a risky behavior. Um, so just some basic kind of safer sex best practices. Uh, condoms should be used when having sex with men and on sex toys. Uh, more about this in the episode, cleaning your cock. Um, <laughs> and workshop cleaning your cock, uh, clip conference. Uh, condo sex toys should not be shared uh, change condoms and dental dams uh, and gloves with changing orifices. Uh, so by that I mean uh, ass to mouth. Uh, if you're changing from vagina to ass and back and forth, like definitely change gloves. In between, uh, if you're going to do anal play, uh, be it digital, be it with a toy, always change a uh, condom or glove before you use it in the badge. Very important for the pH balance. <laughs> um, as Janine Mazzaro points out, few, if any, states collect data on women who have sex with women. Um, and it wasn't available in t to put on the census until this census cycle. So um, that definitely contributes to the, the silence about lesbian sexual health um, and sexual health for queer women. Um, and as I said before, uh, health providers often fail to get full sexual histories from patients after an STD diagnosis. Um, so what do we think is really keeping lesbians from having safer sex in the first place and from talking about it uh, in a more informal way? Past like the whole medical idea of lesbian sex as being safer sex no matter what, I think that that, that idea extends into just everyday people. Like I know when I was in high school and like started, I started having sex, I was under the impression that there was absolutely no way I could get anything. Of course not, because I can't get pregnant, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. therefore, and it, I mean, it's not talked about, I would say, I mean, I don't know about, like, high school, <coughs> not the best, like, sex, sex education at all, mm -hmm. but I would assume that even in a lot of schools that do have pretty comprehensive sex education, that they're not necessarily talking about, like, dental dam use, or about, like, how to make a dental dam out of a condom, or out of a glove, yeah. or anything like that. I think, like, kind of a lot of folks first connotation like association with like dangerous sex for female body folks is oh no pregnancy dun 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 <laughs> and then things come after that you know I don't know so or 
just bodily fluids in general. Who talks about like bodily fluids? And if you're having sex with a woman, man, there's bodily fluids all over Everywhere. the place. Everywhere. <laughs> 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 to be honest. Some white um, business. <laughs> Did anyone learn about like uh, safer sex, woman to woman, in school? No, well, not from school, but from the the queer youth group. Uh, they did workshops at schools and learned that way. I I, I grew up in the south. Well, not in the south, but I live in the south. Um, so I grew up in Georgia, and no, no. <laughs> I like all our schools had to teach about safe sex because a lot of the pregnancy rate in Atlanta is really, really high. So it was just mostly condom, condom, condom. And then it was like really easy to pass. And they, were, they didn't pass out free condoms. They didn't tell you how to put on a condom. They didn't do anything but say, condoms are available, buy them. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's just stuff wasn't touched like that. It was a bunch of pictures, mostly. Mm -hmm. A bunch of like, this is what will happen. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and it was just like, so, I, yeah. yeah, I just feel like it just depends on where you grow up and um, the people that kind of run your system. It's mm -hmm. a bunch of like really conservative Christians in Georgia. So, and even in like the Atlanta hub where it's like mostly people of color, um, it's really conservative. You know, you don't talk about certain things. And the way that like, since they have to promote safer sex and they have to, realize people are having sex, the only thing they want to show you is like every scary thing that can happen to you <laughs> so that you can be scared away from sex and be like, no. For those of us who did learn uh, something about women who had <laughs> sex with women uh, before they turned 18 years old, uh, can we, t like, can can I hear a little bit about what y'all learned? Because I'm, was it thorough? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, received some education about uh, protection between female body people having sex, but it was mostly because in my health class I kvetched a lot and my teacher was a bull dyke. So she was, yeah, <laughs> so my health teacher was like the softball coach. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and you know, that's why she, yeah, thanks. Um, it's pretty common. Um, so that's why I actually was able to talk about topic in class, but that was teacher to teacher. And a lot, plenty of my friends were in classes where their teachers told them over and over again, oh, female ejaculation is a man. So <laughs> oh, wow. misinformation. So I just lucked out with my teacher, really. I don't think it was much of an institutional push. Any other youth group kids? I know I was a youth yeah. group kid. Yeah. That's where I got most of it. Yeah. yeah. But I found that like a lot of like the information that I got in queer youth group was like largely uh, like very informal and like sometimes like not as accurate as I like needed it to be. I, I was definitely told that I like was there was no risk of me contracting HIV. You know, like that there was no risk of me contracting all of these things. Like, are people having? I mean, even like <laughs> I'm I'm a big old nerd and I'm really into research and I always have been. So like from the age of twelve and I was like I think I'm really gay. I just started looking up everything I could on the internet. And even then, like today, there are a lot more resources of thorough, like easy to understand, easy to digest safe sex information than there was like nine, 10 years ago. Because mm -hmm. um, when I started looking up, like maybe someday I'll have sex with a girl <laughs> um, information. I mean, there was some, like I definitely, I, I knew some safe, safer sex between female body people information before I was 18. But even that was like, well, I got it off the internet. How real could that be? 